Hi everybody, it's Daniel with Fun Ukulele Projects, and I have a really fun project right here. And this is actually my second attempt at this video because I just did a nice video and I forgot to turn on the digital audio recorder. <laughs> so this video is about this little ukulele here. I don't know what make it is. It just says accoutrements at the top with some numbers. And it says Aloha, but I don't think Aloha has anything to do with the company. I think it says Aloha because it's a little Hawaiian scene. And I'm quite positive, I'm quite positive this was primarily just meant to be a tourist instrument that hangs on a wall. It was never really meant to be played. And the reason I say that, it will become self-evident when I put a post the photo, which I'll post right now, of the original listing. If you take a close look at the bridge, you'll notice something wrong with it. Um, I'll wait a second and give you a chance to notice it. Now, those of you that might be having trouble, it's a slotted bridge. Look where the slots are in relation to the neck and, and the nut of the instrument and the headstock. The slots are on the same side. The bridge is, has been mounted backwards. So this instrument couldn't play. And so, uh, you know, someone that doesn't know better would have, you know, possibly bought it, but it wouldn't, wouldn't even add strings on it. And, you know, uh, I decided in looking at this instrument closely, uh, I noticed that the, str the, the frets look gold. I knew they wouldn't be gold frets, but they'd be brass frets. I also noticed that the saddle on this instrument had a, a brass saddle. And so, uh, as I took a close look at it, I noticed that the wood really looked like basswood, and you know, a basswood instrument done right can actually have a nice sound. So I decided to take a chance on it. It wasn't like I was risking a lot. I think it was like $13, and nobody was bidding on it, and I don't blame them. The bridge was on backwards. So when it arrived, I uh, knew immediately I had, to, I had to remove the bridge. I had to reset the bridge, and when I went to take the bridge off um, after heating it and getting it to, to, to loosen, I noticed it just practically popped off. It was very easy uh, once it was heated a little to pop the bridge off. And the reason for that was because the bridge um, was just glued on to the finish. Whoever made this didn't even take the time to remove the finish from where the bridge is supposed to go so the bridge would be glowing onto wood. But even if they did take the time to do that, it wouldn't have mattered because you see this dark black bridge that looks like ebony is just stained wood. It's probably itself basswood or something. Uh, it might be a little harder than basswood. Actually, it's a pretty hard wood. Um, but it's, it's a blonde wood that was stained dark. And the bottom of the bridge was dark. And I have a photo I'll show you of that. So what I had to do to fix this, step one, was I needed to lay out the the bridge so that I knew you know where it would go because I needed to then uh, essentially I use masking tape make a frame that the bridge would sit in exactly so then I knew where to scrape the uh, the finish off and that took a while it was a pretty thick finish that's on it but I scraped it all off and then I had to uh, remove the finish off the bottom of the bridge and that was my chance to adjust the action. Since this is essentially just a brass fret, I can't, you know, file the fret down. It's as low as it's going to go. So I had to lower the action by sanding the entire bridge down. And that was fine because I, I had a long ways to go. Uh, what I did to, to, to figure out the action, because now, you know, it didn't have strings on it or anything. I set the bridge in place once I, once I uh, cleared the finish off and I was against wood then I knew exactly you know how high in relation to the soundboard the bridge was going to sit so I set the bridge in place I very carefully put an engineer rule uh, in one of the slots and I lined it up and then once the engineer rule was in place I could very carefully hold it use my um, you know the the action gauge and I could see how many millimeters it was up off the 12th fret and it was over three and a half millimeters. It wasn't quite four, but it was over three and a half millimeters off the 12th fret. And the nut, the slots at the nut were over two millimeters. The action at the first fret was over two millimeters. 
So this thing was just not playable. Even if the bridge was put on properly, this thing was absolutely, completely, utterly unplayable. If someone were to try to tune it and get the open strings tuned, uh, the second they tried to fret anything, the note that they wanted to play it would never play. Um, but it was pretty, you know, in a rustic sort of way. So I then I kept sanding the, the bridge until I got the action to where it would be around two point between 2.5 and 2.75 uh, up here. I didn't want to go too low or I'm going to start touching you know the front of the, of the bridge. And then I used the original wood nut but I had to be really careful uh, in, to try to even play it with that because the original wood nut the slots were only 24 millimeters G to A and that is tiny. Uh, the smallest string spacing like on the camp ukes is around 26.5 and I that's about the limits of what I can actually play 24 was just impossible but uh, in order to try to keep everything original initially I did file them down until they had a good height uh, at the first fret tried playing it uh, you know chords like D forget it D wasn't be impossible for me with my hands on that string spacing and um, because we're not only dealing with the narrow, the narrow, you know, G to A string spacing, we're dealing with a 12 and 5 eighths inch, like a short scale soprano. It's not a 12 inch, you know, sopranino, but it's a 12 and 5 eighths inch, you know, soprano. So um, I decided to, you know, put a wood nut on it. I mean, a bone nut. I, so I carefully removed the wood nut. And I had a 38 millimeter bone nut that I never used because it for for 38 millimeter nut it's got really narrow string spacing at 28 millimeters, but on this instrument since it's got 28 millimeter string spacing here, and I've only got 38 millimeters down here at the bridge and, and over the saddle, it, it works and it turned out to work quite nicely. And the combination of the brass saddle with the bone nut. Uh, really works on this instrument with the brass frets and, and the basswood. It's not super thick basswood. This is not the most resonant instrument you'll ever hear by any any stretch of the imagination. Yet it has incredible sustain, which I'll attribute to once again. You got a brass a brass saddle. You got a bone nut, and it's a solidly built instrument. So. Um, but for its size, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not light, but it's not like a tank. And uh, so it has actually really good sustain. And what's really nice about it is that uh, the, the decay of the volume is very, very even. And it also has, you know, it's pretty even the way it sounds up as you play up the fretboard. I've actually played Canon and D on this. It's a little tricky up at the 7th to 12th fret, but you can play it. And um, because the decay is so even, it makes this instrument a really nice little instrument to practice, you know, chord melody arrangements on. And I like practicing chord melody arrangements on, you know, sopranos, my concerts and sopranos, even though I primarily play tenor, because they force you to be much more precise with your fingering. And, uh, and I find that if I practice on the soprano uh, and then I go to like the concert or, or tenor, you know, it, it's so much easier. And so I do like practicing with, you know, sopranos. I've got low G sopranos. I've got, uh, you know, re-entrant sopranos. Anyway, I'll play some pieces for you. Uh, oh, one more thing I'll say on the volume. You know, I if you compare this like with, uh, you take the sustain, uh, if you, you know, uh, or you take volume versus sustain, the probably the extreme end of that on the other end would be like the Camp Ukuleles by Lion and Healy. And I'll have two more in a video, two videos from now that I, that I restored for a friend. And uh, if you, if like, if my arm was like this instrument here would be, you know, from the beginning of the notes here and the end of the note is here, 
this instrument will go like this and it will decay very carefully, very evenly, you know, to here. The line in here can't be, the volume will go like this, but then it decays like this. They don't sustain as long as this. In fact, I gave this thing a very unfair just test, you know, earlier today. I was playing numerous pieces on my Favia double bout and on another instrument that will be the subject of my next video that was the silver tone uh, soprano that I restored uh, probably 1940s silver tone it was all solid mahogany and that one is you know very Koaloa-esque in its resonance and it has decent sustain but this actually will sustain longer than that this the lion and Healy will sustain a little longer than this uh, Lion and Healy, though, it's like, you know, if I want to compare it to modern brands, the Lion and Healy would be like a, you know, a Canilea in, the, in the, the clarity, the note clarity and everything. And then the silver tone would be more like a Koaloha. Well, this wouldn't be like either of those in terms of volume, but it's sustain, as I said, it, it holds really well. And because it doesn't get quite as loud, but it holds for nearly as long, it makes for a very even sound. Uh, and it makes it a very pleasant, you know, practice experience. Anyway, I'll try to play, play through a few different pieces here. Just doing a traditional finger pick is challenging for me. It is pretty narrow string spacing for me, but it's it's fun. And once again, even that, it makes me more precise. And when I go to instruments that have wider string spacing, it just makes it that much easier. Here's a generic strum. Here, I'll play Sonoe. I really like the way this thing plays Sanoe. Here's a uh, sweet hour prayer. And I'll finish off with, once again, uh, the first part of Aaron Keim's uh, Roxy Waltz.
Well, it wasn't perfect, but you get the idea. <clears throat> One other uh, thing I did other than fix the bridge and put a new nut on it, I did add just, just paint dots uh, for FET markers there and on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side. I just matched the color of yellow that was used for the stenciling. I wasn't concerned that they're perfectly round or anything. The stenciling's not perfect. And um, the, uh, you know, I just wanted to make it easier to play. It's a really fun instrument to play. It has a really sweet tone to it. Uh, and it was a particularly fun project because it, you know, was obviously a, a tourist item that someone bought at some point in time and uh, you know even on eBay at what 13 uh, this is probably under 12 like $13 or so no one wanted to even bid on it and I thought it had potential I thought you know this could potentially be a nice sounding instrument and I'm really glad that I bid on it in the last hour or so of the auction and I was the only bidder <laughs> But it's a really fun instrument to play. It's a really fun ukulele, and uh, it, talking about making fingering precise, it's narrower at the the strings are narrower at the at the saddle than I care for. Um, the nut I've played narrower up here, and the the campings are narrower. But this little tiny 12 and 5 8 inch scale really makes uh, you know makes me very precise. Makes me be very precise with my fingering. The only other thing I'll mention that is really, I think, uh, a, a key part of the sound <clears throat> is I'm using that light gauge PhD string set that, that um, I'd asked Jason to put together for me when I asked him if he could put together a, a, a light gauge you know, PhD string set for vintage instruments. Uh, I really think they help this instrument sing. and. Um, it's just a wonderful, it's a wonderful uh, practice ukulele. So I do want to share it with you. Thanks for watching. Stay safe. Stay healthy. I'll see you in the next video.